Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for Noel. We thank you for this declaration that God comes to this earth fully divine, fully human, to walk alongside of us through our challenges, through our struggles, through our successes, and in our breakthroughs, to remind us that we are not alone. And God, I pray that our, our sense, our awareness of your presence, of the fact that you are with us, not generically, but specifically, I pray that that sense would be very real to us in this moment. Lord, I pray that you would meet each one of us in our moment of need, that you would open our ears and our minds and our hearts to receive your truth, and that you would give us the grace and the courage to apply it to our lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning. It's so good to have all of you here with us. We're continuing our series on uh, Imperfect Christmas, and last week, Craig, our lead pastor, did a brilliant job of breaking down the, the Rahab story, talking about the scarlet thread, about how God uses people with scandalous backstories and includes them in the lineage and in the arc of the narrative of the Messiah. So today we want to talk about this, a, an imperfect guest. I don't know if you've ever been an imperfect guest. I know I have. For me, the date was January 6, 1990. I was 15 years old. I'd grown up in suburban Chicago, and I had an opportunity to go to a Bears playoff game at Soldier Field. Uh, the problem was, I had to go by myself. So I remember walking up to the stadium with a solitary ticket in my pocket. Here's how that happened. My brother was working for a consulting firm. He had the opportunity to go watch the game at the company's private box at their luxury suite. He was not available. He gave his ticket to me. He goes, you can go. The catch is, you won't know anybody, and nobody will know you or possibly even care that you're there. Do you still want to do it? And I'm like, absolutely. I've never been in a box before. I thought it was awesome. So I got to the stadium. I showed them my ticket. They brought me down that very fancy hallway, and I got to go in the secret elevator, and I got to go where all the important people watch games. And I walk into the luxury box, and there's probably 10 to 15 white-collar executives and their families, and nobody knew who I was at all. Now, people weren't, weren't unkind. They were all very gracious, but I knew immediately that I didn't belong there. And I, I, could, I could sense people saying, like, who is this guy? And why is he eating all of the canapes and the chicken wings? Like, I, I remember this very vividly. There was, there was a woman who came by with not a dessert tray, a dessert cart. So there were three levels of trays. And I, I went to town. I consumed large quantities of chocolate that day because I was free. I wasn't paid for it. I had no shame. I was never going to see these people again. And I, I think that as I was walking out, I knew, like I knew in my gut, I'm like, I didn't belong there at all. I'm so glad I got to crash that party. It was epic. <laughs> Have you ever had a moment where you had somebody come into an event that you were hosting that you did not anticipate at all? Maybe there was some tension between them and an invited guest and the whole thing got weird fast. Is anybody, and you don't have to raise your hands, but has anybody ever been a part of that event? You've been hosting something and uh, somebody who was not supposed to be there arrived? Or worse yet, you showed up an event and it became clear to you immediately after you walked through the front door that the hosts were not expecting you. And it made for a very long and awkward evening. Anybody ever been there for that? That is the tension of what it means to be an imperfect guest. And today we're talking about exactly that. We're going to be looking at an imperfect guest in the scriptures. So if you've got a copy of the scriptures, you can turn to Matthew chapter 1 uh, in your Bible. It should be page 965. And in it, we read this, this genealogy, this history of Jesus' family. And in the middle of it, we, go, we hear that Solomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse. And then the implication is that Jesse is the father of David, and David was the first maje like very famous, historic, heroic king in Israel's history. Uh, his predecessor, Saul, didn't have a, a great run. But David, King David, was going to set the stage for all of Israel's glory, and out of his line, his descendants would give rise to the Messiah. So there's two interesting names in there. One, Rahab, that Craig talked about last week, and then Ruth. So what do Rahab and Ruth both share in common? Well, they're both outsiders. They're both foreigners. 
And again, Craig said this last week, and I want to reiterate, Matthew is writing this gospel at a time when Jewish nationalism is at a fever pitch. So to include Ruth is a curious choice. If you've ever been to Israel, if you've ever run in Jewish circles, you know that there's this train of thought that you are only Jewish if your mother was Jewish. It's this whole idea of matrilinear succession. So to include two women who were very notably not Jewish, and you're trying to set up a pure bloodline, would have been controversial at many possible levels. So in my family history, we have the very unique distinction of having a United States president in my family line. That's the good news. The bad news is he was arguably one of the worst presidents in our nation's history. Yes, I am like an indirect descendant of Warren G. Harding. Some of you are like, I have no idea who that guy is. That's that, exactly. All right, and those of you who do are like, oh yeah, that guy was involved in like X, Y, and Z scandals, precisely. So when we introduce ourselves, we don't announce that to people. You're now part of my trusted inner circle. (laughs) You you don't don't go broadcasting all of the gory details and all the just horrific failures of people in your history. But that's exactly, it's exactly what Matthew is doing here. And so in the book, in order for us to understand this why, why it's so majestic, why it's so fascinating that Ruth got included in this circle, that Ruth's name is in this line, we have to go back and look at the book of Ruth itself. And if you've never read the book, it's four short chapters. I'm going to kind of walk you through an abbreviated timeline of Ruth's story. We pick up here in Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the days when the judges ruled... There was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and sons went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Paphrites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After that, they had lived there about 10 years. Both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So what do we learn here right out of the gate? We learn that Ruth is an ethnic outsider. She comes from an imperfect family. She comes from an imperfect faith. The Moabites would have been considered pagans by the Israelites. And she's got imperfect finances. So the Moabites are the Israelites' historic enemies. And they're, they're kind of distant cousins by blood, but if you trace their story all the way back, you'll see that the Moabites were born out of the line of Lot, which was like Abraham's less faithful relative. And his, that whole nation was born out of the aftermath of Sodom and Gomorrah. So there's all sorts of in, kind of sordid and scandalous roots to the Moabite people. After Ruth loses her husband, and after Naomi loses her husband, Ruth, Naomi makes a very difficult decision to go back. The famine is over. She learns that there's opportunity for her to maybe return to her homeland near Bethlehem. And there's just not a lot for her in Moab anymore. So she tells both of her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, hey, I'm going to go back. And Orpah says, hey, have a great trip. I'm never going to see you again. Ruth, on the other hand, goes through this internal struggle. And she says, you know what? My family is here. My nation is here. My culture is here. My roots are here. But there's, there's something incredible about Naomi. And there's something intriguing about her character. And there's something inspiring about the way that she talks about her God and the way that she talks about her people. So there's a very famous line that Ruth utters in this drama where she goes, Naomi, I want to go with you. I want your God to be my God. I want your people to become my people. So... Ruth literally is standing at the water's edge when she makes this decision. If you look at a modern-day map, you'll see that ancient Moab is now modern-day Jordan, and ancient Israel is now modern-day Israel in the West Bank. And Ruth makes that journey with Naomi into a new land, into a new territory, and into a new future. The problem is they have no means to provide for their physical needs. So when they get there, Naomi has an idea. She's going to send her to work in the fields for her meals. We pick up this in Ruth chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, meaning Boaz, who owned an estate. He was an influential landowner and business leader in the day. Because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So she goes, we don't have a lot of close family roots, so let's kind of hide under the umbrella of our distant family roots, and maybe people will give us a break. 
So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean, to harvest the barley and wheat harvests until they were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, this is interesting. Ruth doesn't have a job. Nobody has hired her. Nobody has asked her to work. She's not even, she's not even coming in as a temp. She's just showing up at a field. Now, why would Naomi send her to a factory where she doesn't have an actual job? Here's why. Naomi understands the ancient Hebrew code of hospitality. Last week, Pastor Craig was talking about that safety net that had been created so that women weren't left alone and vulnerable. Here's another example of those safety nets in ancient Hebrew culture. We found it in Leviticus chapter 19. It says, when you, the people of Israel, enter into a harvest, and you harvest your land, don't reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Don't go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. Why? Because I am the Lord your God. I'm the Lord your God. So what they said is, leave the edges of your fields unplowed on purpose. Leave a couple of extra grapes on the trail as you make your way back home. Why? Because there are people who are starving and the way that we care for them is not just by giving them free food, but allowing them to come to the field, do a version of work that they can actually do. They're not doing all the heavy labor. They're not swinging the scythe. All they're doing is they're walking behind you and picking up the leftovers. And in, in, in so doing, what have we done? We create a system that not only gives food to the vulnerable, but it gives dignity to the vulnerable because it's allowing them to get their hands dirty as they participate in meeting their own needs. But this verse in this story reminds us that what? That Ruth is a financial liability. She has no assets and she has no marketable skills. And unfortunately, Naomi knows that when the harvest is over, they're going to be in a severe set of circumstances again. The reason that they moved at all is they had no group of people advocating for them. Their husbands and their father-in-laws were gone. They were completely exposed and vulnerable on the economic front. So Naomi comes up with a strategy. It is unique. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you. Another translation says, I've got to find a rest for you. I've got to find a place you can put down some roots where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Now, if I'm Ruth, I'm like, I don't know what is happening right now. This sounds all very odd. She's like, get, take, get yourself a shower, put on your best dress, and then go ambush some sleeping dude at work in the middle of the night. This sounds odd. If it sounds weird, that's because it is. <laughs> I will do whatever you say, said Ruth. Again, so what do we have in Ruth? We have like this innocent, this, this wonder. She's probably in her, uh, in her mid to late 20s, and she's like, all right, Naomi, you haven't let me down thus far. I trust you. Whatever the game is, I'm up for it. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, you can make your own inferences there, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. There's an exclamation point. That's in the Hebrew and in the English, all right? Like, I don't know about you, but if I'm taking a nap at work and I wake up and there's a strange woman lying at my feet, I am, I'm awake now. So this, this, this is just odd. And so, and then I love, I love Naomi's tactic. She's like, hey, you know how you wake him up? Take his comforter off of his feet. Ever, anybody ever woken up because your feet are cold? That, that's Naomi's, that's a biblical strategy for waking somebody up. Just ripping the comforter off of their ankles. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me. So she's not, she's not asking for a blanket. What's she asking for? She's asking for cover. She said, will you cover me? Will you allow me to live under the umbrella of your authority, your resources, and your care? Since you are the guardian redeemer of my family. The Lord bless you, my daughter. He replied, this kindness is greater 
than that which you showed earlier. You've not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. All the people of my town will know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it's true that I am the guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and if, if in the morning he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized, and he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. So what's going on here? Like, why did, is, is, did Ruth just say, is, is this a cash grab? Is she a gold digger? She's like, hey, this is the wealthiest guy in town. I'm just going to kind of crawl into his sleeping bag and see what I can get. Not, no, that's not what's happening at all. There is, again, just like there was for the gleaning the edges of the field, there's another passage in Leviticus that gives backstory to what's happening in this moment. We read it in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 25. It says, if one of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell some of their property, the nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold. So who's the person who became poor? In this story, it's Naomi. Naomi's life was devastated by the famine. She fled the country in fear for her life. She was gone for more than a decade. Somebody else said, Naomi's gone. We haven't heard from her. We have no idea what's happened to her or her family. We're going to go ahead and assume control. We're just going to have like the right of occupation over her land. So if Naomi wants to have any kind of generational future, if she wants to have any kind of financial or cultural stake in that land, she needs her home back. She has no money with which to buy it. So the biblical code is, if somebody in your family is broke and they have to sell their home to survive, the closest family member has to buy that home back from whoever they sold it to. And that way, that property will stay in the family. It's kind of continued later on in the passage. It says this, if any of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to you, do not make them work as slaves. They are to be treated as hired workers or temporary residents among you. They are to work for you until the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, there was the year of Jubilee. All slaves were released, all debts were canceled, all homes and lands returned to their tribe of origin. Then they and their children are to be released, and they will go back to their own clans and to the property of their ancestors. That's what's happening here. A system has been set in place as a preventative measure for a cycle of poverty to be introduced into Hebrew culture. This is a safeguard. This is a safety net. This is a guardrail. And in this particular story, there is a guardian redeemer who is closer to Naomi and her family than Boaz is. So he has the right, the legal, legal term here is what? Right of first refusal. He's got the right of first refusal. So the very next day, this, this gentleman, Boaz, all of the city elders gather at the gates of Bethlehem. So it would have been their version of the county courthouse, but it was a public gathering so that everybody could witness exactly how this was going to go down. And so basically, the next of kin says, you know what? I don't want to take on Ruth, Naomi, and all of their land as a liability. I, go, I surrender, I forfeit my right to the next of kin. And Boaz says, I will. I'm going to marry Ruth. I'm going to take care of Naomi. I'm going to make sure that these people have a home, have a future, have rest from all of the chaos and all of the fear and all of the uncertainty that they've been living in for so long. And what I love about this story is that it reminds us that God cares about character and not credentials. God cares about character and not credentials. Ruth has nothing on her resume that would qualify her to be in the line of succession for a Messiah. But she is a woman of great character. She shows faith, she shows honor, she shows risk, she shows boldness at every turn in the story. And maybe, maybe it's because Ruth has nothing that she acts like she has nothing to lose. Because Ruth has nothing, she has nothing to lose. And the reason that she can do all these crazy things that Naomi's asking her to do is because she doesn't really have any other alternatives. And like Tamar and Rahab before her, she risks her safety and her reputation in an act of faith. 
So you heard last week that Rahab hangs this scarlet thread out of the window of her apartment on the walls of the city of Jericho. But Ruth asks for a corner of Boaz's comforter to save her family, to save her and Naomi. And what happens? As a result of this moment, it says, the elders and all of the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Epaphra and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, they're talking to Boaz, may your family be like that of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah. So the entire city doesn't begrudgingly accept this woman, this entire city, because she has Boaz running as her lead blocker, says, hey, if he's on board with her, we're on board with her, may God bless this union, may God bless this tribe, may God bless our future. And here's what I love about this story. God's decision to fold Ruth in, not as a second citizen, but as a full member of the family of God, reminds us that God does not tolerate outsiders. He celebrates them. God does not spare the weak. He blesses them. God doesn't leave the marginalized on the margins. He puts them on center stage. He gives them a starring role in his act of redemption. And in this moment, God changes Ruth's status from reject to royalty. And if God can choose Ruth, let me contend that no matter where you are, what you've done, or where you've been, or what your backstory is like, God can choose you too. God can choose you too. I don't know if you've had a season in your life, but I'm going to guess that you have where you felt like it didn't belong. Not like an imperfect guest for two hours at a party, but as somebody who didn't belong for a whole season, maybe even a whole run of your life. Psychologist and best-selling author Amy Cuddy calls this the imposter syndrome. She says oftentimes it happens to people who get to certain levels of success in business. They say, I don't really deserve to be making this much money and having this much influence. I don't belong here. It's only a matter of time before I'm exposed. Everybody finds me out and then I get fired. Can you you imagine kind of looking over your shoulder for years or decades saying, I don't belong. I just barely skated in and it's only a matter of time before I'm found out. And my guess is that many of us in different iterations or different seasons or different dynamics have struggled with that. That there's this this kind of gnawing voice in the back of your brain that says, somebody's going to find out that you're not supposed to be here. That you don't have the right education. That you don't have the perfect family backstory. That you don't have a perfect record when it comes to the choices that you have made in the secret parts of your life. And sometimes those voices are echoes of actual people. They have names and faces that we've heard that say, you don't belong, you don't measure up, you fail. And then other times it's just kind of this disembodied haunting declaration that we're nothing. And I believe that the Bible does teach that there is an enemy of our souls who seeks at every turn to undercut our sense of belovedness that we feel from God, seeks to undermine and chip away at our identity in Christ, that seeks to push loads of shame and condemnation on us at every turn. And what I love about this story, and what I love about the broader theme of Scripture, is that God has come to silence that accuser. Just in my own time with God, I've been reading through the book of Revelation, there's this great verse in Revelation 11 and 12 that talks about how God comes to shut the accuser down. There's a, there's a time where he'll be silenced for all eternity. But in the meantime, sometimes we ha- still have to walk through our lives with the, the lies of the enemy pinging around in the back of our brains. You don't measure up. You don't belong. You're not a part of this group. And what I love is God says, no, there's room for everybody at my table. My mercy is greater. My love is more vast than anything that you've done or thought or said or represented in your backstory. 
So here are two challenges that I want to pull for all of us out of this story. My guess is that we, we usually fall into one of two groups, not to oversimplify this, but I think we either fall into two camps. Either we are Ruth-type people or we are Naomi-type people. And if you're a Ruth-type person, you're, you're standing at a crossroads. Because before Ruth decided to go home, go back to Bethlehem with Naomi, Ruth had to make a decision about who was going to be her God, what family she was going to identify with, what she was going to put her hopes in. And maybe you're somebody who you've just been kind of orbiting around the outside edges of the family of God. Just kind of, kind of looking from the outside in saying, wow, it would be great if there was a seat for me in there, but I, I still don't know if I belong. My challenge for you, if you are Ruth, before she made that commitment to Naomi, is that you would do this, that you would take your seat at the table of the family of God because there is a seat that is reserved with your name on it. And the prayer that I want to ask you to pray is, Jesus, I am ready for you to be my God. I've rolled with other gods. I've worshipped myself. I've worshipped my habits. I've worshipped my base instincts. I've worshipped money. I've worshipped success. I've worshipped my addictions. All of those have left me cold and hollow. I'm ready to worship you. Will you lead me into your family? Will you be my God? And will you let your people be my people? Will you take me from being an outsider to an insider? Will you take me from being a reject to being royalty to be part of, of your family? And for some of you, you've heard the message of Jesus over and over and over again, and you've just, you just kind of parked yourself outside the door. But today is the day I want to I ask you to, to cross the threshold and to come on in. And if you've got questions about how that works, we'd be more than happy to answer those for you after the service. If you're a Ruth, I want you to find your seat at the table. And if you're a Naomi, if you're somebody who's already been a part of the family of God, you've been a part of the family of God for decades, maybe even generations, I want you to turn your gaze towards the edges. And the prayer that I want you to pray is, Lord, will you give me eyes for the outsider? Will you give me eyes for the outsider? Some of you have heard me say this before, but one of my favorite quotes about bringing the message of Jesus to other people is by a friend of mine by the name of Alex McManus. He says this, the gospel always finds you on its way to somebody else. The gospel always finds you on its way to somebody else. None of us are terminal stops in the message of Jesus Christ. God doesn't say, hey, I'm going to orchestrate all these circumstances and make sure that you get to hear about my love and my redeeming work, and I'm going to bring you into the fold, and you're going to get forgiven, and you're going to get restored, and then you, and then you just get to kick up your feet and wait for Jesus to come back. That, that verse is not in there. Jesus finds us and then mobilizes us to be a part of amplifying hope and life to the next person who hasn't heard it in a way that they understand just yet. And here's what we need to understand. God will use the circumstances of our lives. God will orchestrate the circumstances of our lives to push us into the lives of people who don't know him, whether we want to be there or not. Let me ask you this question. What set of circumstances did God use to put Naomi in Ruth's circle of influence? What circumstance did God use? God used a famine. God used harsh set of circumstances in Naomi's life to push her into a place that she would never wise, would, would not otherwise have chosen to go. So I don't know about you, but we talked about this in the Space Between series. Sometimes when I have difficult circumstances in my life, I'm like, God, why me? Why are, why are you hurt me? Why are you picking on me? Why don't I get to have a fun, easy, comfortable, pain-free life like everybody else? I'm so focused about my own pain and my own discomfort that I'm not able to pause and zoom back and say, God, what are you doing here? And is there a reason that you are allowing discomfort into my life? And is it possible that you're using it to nudge me out of a comfort zone so I could be proactively moving into a space that you are already at work in ways that I don't fully understand? Some of us, we keep asking God, why? When maybe the question that we need to be asking God is, who? Not why am I in these circumstances, but Lord, now that I'm in these circumstances, even for reasons that I don't understand, who would you have me reach while I'm here? What do Ruth and Naomi have in common? They have shared deep loss together. Their grief is what binds them. 
Ruth has watched Naomi lose a husband. And when Ruth lost her husband, Naomi also lost a son. And what I love about this story is that how long, how long has Naomi been watching Ruth? Before, how long has Na- Ruth been watching Naomi before she made her profession of faith? How long? Ten years. Ten years. What kind of observations do you think you can make about somebody's character in ten years? A lot. So my question is this. Is it possible that God has already moved you as a Naomi into the life of a Ruth? And somebody in your place of work or somebody in your extended family or somebody in your neighborhood has been watching your character. And they've been watching your pain. And they've been watching your faith. They've seen you on your best days and they've seen you on your worst. And you have been able to light a compelling flame of curiosity in their minds and hearts. And some of us, some of us say, well, you know what? I'm just going to cross my fingers and keep living a good example. I'm going to be the silent witness and eventually somebody else is going to figure it out. Let's be clear. Naomi did not send Ruth a bunch of inspirational texts and hope that she figured it out. She just kind of like put, put some verses and some butterflies on her Facebook page and then one day the switch magically got flipped for Ruth. That's not how it happened. She was so fully invested in her life that when the moment came and Ruth said, I want in, Naomi was able to take her there. Are you? Do you have eyes for a Ruth that is in your life? You've heard us say over and over and over again, hey, we really do believe that God is going to use the Christmas store and God is going to use the Christmas experience and God is going to use the Christmas Eve uh, service to take people who have questions about God and bring them into his family. The best way for those people to be in this space, whether physically in this room or virtually watching it online, is for them to get an invitation from somebody that they trust. Somebody that they trust. So the great challenge for you headed into this Christmas season, for those of you who are already followers of Jesus Christ, as you leave the service, you're going to get a chance to grab some invite cards for the Christmas experience. And I want you to pray over those cards as you drive off of this property today. Say, God, will you give me eyes to see somebody who is ready? Somebody who's ready, somebody who is ripe for a harvest. Somebody who's just kind of standing at the door waiting for an invitation to come in. God, will you give me at least three people this holiday season? that I could extend an invitation for them to come and participate, not just an experience, but for them to come and participate in the kingdom of God. And I believe that when that doesn't happen, it's not because God didn't want it to happen, but it's because we set our sights too low. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. If there's one prayer that I can promise you that God will answer for you this Christmas season, it's this prayer. God, show me who you want me to invite to take the next step in their journey. God's going to answer that prayer. Why? Because God wants that for you. There's something that's going to stretch your faith. There's something that's going to equip and empower you. God's going to embolden you and inspire you when you're a part of that conversation. And God wants that for you and God wants that for them. When people get rolled into the family of God, It's catalytic for an entire community. And when people come to faith as a result of our faith, we're changed, they're changed, this this church is changed, and this town is changed. And I don't think you want to settle for anything less than that. Because that's the beauty, that's the light, that's the joy that we have in this season. So there's one more line that I want to share with you. This is from one of my favorite Christmas hymns. I'm going to give you a gift by not singing it, but we're going to have an opportunity to, to raise up our voices and sing this hymn in just a couple of weeks. But this is from O Come, Emmanuel. There's this line that says, O come, O rod of Jesse's stem. It's just a very poetic way of referring to the Messiah. Jesse is who? Jesse is Ruth's grandson. Jesse is David's father. Jesse is in the line of the Messiah. The Messiah is born in Bethlehem. Why? Because that's where Ruth and Boaz made their home. O come, O rod of Jesse's stem, from every foe deliver them that trust your mighty power to save. 
Bring them in victory through the grave. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. And the song says, Jesus has coming. Jesus has come. Jesus is coming. Jesus will come again. And because we have that hope, we really do believe that God is bringing people in victory through the grave. Whether they're struggling with the fear of actual physical death or whether they're struggling with fear in their relationships and their battle for sobriety in their financial well-being or in their physical health. Jesus wants to bring every single person in this room, every single person who's joining us online, every single person who's going to be touched by what happens in this place over the next few weeks. He wants to, do, he wants to bring every single one of them out of the shadow of death and out of the fear and out of the anxiety and out of the uncertainty that comes with them and wants to plant their feet just like he did for Ruth in the rest and the hope and the security that comes from knowing that we have a home. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your scriptures. I thank you for the reminder in them that you are constantly at work. You are drawing individuals. You're drawing families. Yes, you're drawing entire nations to you. And I thank you, Lord, that for any single one of us who want it, we have a front row seat to your redemptive work. And God, I don't want to get caught watching it unfold this Christmas. I want to move with you. I want to step where you're stepping. I want to care about what you care about. I want to see the people that you see. People that I wouldn't otherwise see because I'm so consumed with my own agenda and my own life and my own comforts. God, oh, I pray that you would just expand my vision and that you would liberate us from our, our cultural and even our religious blinders so that we can see the world that you see it. And that people who are open but lonely, or people who are eager but feel trapped in darkness, those people would catch our eye this season. And that we would have the great privilege of taking them by the hand and saying, let's come, come to Bethlehem with me. And let's find Christ together. Lord, reveal yourself to us in fresh and powerful ways this season so that we might be a part of seeing you reveal yourself to others. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.